Hi, I'm Darren and this is Ruth and today we've already installed one slinky and we're just about to install the second one on this lovely site in Devon and then we're going to show you at the other end how we're going to connect up a subterranean manifold. Okay, so we've brought the two slinkies back and we've brought what we call the headers of the slinkies back to this point of the manifold. And what's really important at this stage is that this manifold is sighted so that the lid of the manifold, which is here, actually finishes at ground level. So it's really important that we get this sighted and as you can see, it's built up on the sand here just to bring it up higher than the slinkies because they're at 1.2 deep and this manifold's only 800 deep. So it's really important we make sure that that finishes up at exactly the right height. What we've done from there is we've put two pipes in, which are gonna be the header pipes, which are gonna come back along here and back in through the two ducts that the builder's already built, put in place. Now those ducts just follow through underneath the slab of the building and then up through the floor. And these two pipes here that are already capped off and got the insulation on are the two header pipes that come back from that manifold. So where we put in, we might put in a multiple of slinkies on one side of the manifold, where they all connect up, there's only ever two pipes that come back into the property. Now, when we've pushed these two pipes down, because the pipe that's going up through the duct is not in contact with the ground and it's not gaining energy from the ground, we've put what we call armor flex lagging on the pipework. You can use any insulation you like, but as long as you put some form of barrier to prevent condensation. Remember, these pipes coming up into the building are gonna be at a nice cold temperature, probably around about eight, 10 degrees. And your, your room's probably gonna be about 21 degrees, so there will be condensation on those pipes if you don't lag them. We've got the manifold in place now, and we're quite happy with where it's located. And as you can see from quite a lot of the stuff around me, it's not always really, really easy to connect onto. We've got other services, drainage coming through here rainwater is going to eventually go around through this trench as well. So what we're going to look at first is cleaning up the connections on the manifold. Now on the manifold you've got some flow connections which are on the top and you can tell they're the flow connections because you've got an arrow on the inside on your flow gauge. Okay, and what I'm going to do is just clean up the fittings on the outside because that's where we're going to connect to. And we want to make sure that we've got a really nice connection and a clean connection on there without any gouges out of the pipe. If there was deep gouges in that pipe, you'd have to really clean this fitting back to make sure that you don't get any leaks. Because what we're about to do, everything that is buried in the ground is actually electrofusion welded. And what we're gonna use here is what we call a 40 mil by 32 electrofusion reducer. And I'm gonna connect that up in a sec and show you how we do that. Um, but basically, the stubs are 40 mil that come with the manifold, but the pipes that actually come in the slinkies are 32 mil. You might wonder, well, why would they make those 40 mil? Well, actually, if you used to connect this to boreholes, borehole probes are 40 mil. So we get away with using the same chamber for either boreholes or slinkies, but we just have to put an adapter. On the other side of that manifold, there are 63 mil stubs. They could potentially either reduce down to 32 mil, like in this instance here, because we've only got a very small amount of energy removing from the field with the two slinkies, or they could step up. It could be that this manifold is located 200 yards from the property because that's the nearest place they can fit it in. So if that happens, we need to know the distance between the manifold and the house. And when we know that distance, we can then calculate the size of the header pipe work. Okay, so one of the first things I'm gonna do is use a posi drive and just with a little impact drive, just tighten that fitting up. Now, what I always do is angle that one to one side and that's because the top ones can come out the front, but when you look at the bottom one, you want to be able to easily get those probes on. So all the bottom ones are slightly angled so that you're not coming in directly above and that pipe hinders you and gets in your way. And just make sure they're both nice and tight and nice and secure. Right, what's really important with these pipes here is that when you first take the tape off or the cap end off of these, is that we don't want debris going down there because if debris goes down there and gets stuck in those valves, you're not gonna get flow through the ground. It's really important that we keep these clean. Okay, so this one here, I'm gonna manipulate into position. I've got a mark on there and that's exactly where I'm gonna cut that pipe. Again, same thing, clean up the end. And just give it a wipe to make sure there's absolutely no dust and dirt on the end of that. 
and then get that locked into place. Okay, so that's the return pipe that I've put in. I'm now gonna do exactly the same with the flow. And I've just marked the pipe and cut the pipe, but where I know it needs to sit inside that at that point there. Okay, so they're both in, they're both connected. And what I'm gonna do is just tighten up the other connections on the other side. Okay, so we've connected the other slinky on now, flow and return. And it's, it's important to say, I suppose, at this point, that both slinkies, it doesn't matter what you decide to call flow and return of these two, and it matters the other side when you go back to the house. Because essentially, this is just one piece of pipe coming all the way back from one end to the other. What's important is just making sure that these two are one slinky and these two are one slinky. You can't cross that one over with that one because you'd never get any flow around any of it. Okay, so it's really important that you keep them in pairs. Sometimes when you've got multiple slinkies, you might color code them with some color coded tape just to denote which one's which. So we're gonna look at the fittings now. One of the first things you'll notice is that each of these fittings has got a little barcode on the side. Now there are electrofusion uh, welding machines that come with a barcode scanner. You can scan that tag on there and it tells the machine exactly how long and at what temperature you've got to cook that fitting for, okay? But if you look at the bag that the fitting came out of, it's your fusion data table. And it tells you a range of, first off, it tells you a range of temperatures at the top. Now, if you're between five and 14 degrees outside, which I'll say we're probably about 10, 12 degrees today, we're gonna to cook that for 40 seconds. Okay, so the outside temperature does vary a little bit, but you're generally around about 38 to 40 seconds. And that that's, tells you on there what type of fitting and how long we've got to cook it for. All we need to do now is put the connections on. I would always push these on and start on the bottom fittings and they go in there. And when we first turn our machine on, the machine will look at the resistance to make sure there's resistance through that and it will tell us that it is safe to carry out that weld. And one of the most important things before we start doing any welding is make sure we're in a dry environment because if there's rain, if there's any of these fittings are damp, they would have to be completely dried off. I've been on many sites where we've been under sheets of ply with tarpaulins because it's the only way we can get the joints done. Okay, so it's really important that everything's dry and everything's clean. Okay, so now we've got that one on there, we're gonna start cooking. We're gonna have a quick look at the machine now before we turn it on. Okay, and our machine here, you can see the display on there, and that's telling us we're gonna press A for 39.5 volts, okay? A is what we, always use this machine on because it's based on these leads okay you could actually attach a barcode scanner to this and then we might be pressing a different part of the menu C um, and there's other various settings on here but we know we don't get involved with any of those we're just going to use a so we press a and then it asks us for how long we want to cook for okay now we know that this fitting is going to take 38 seconds so we're going to put in 038 which gives us 38 and then I'm going to press start now, it's asking me on the screen if the pipes have been scraped, the fitting's connected, and are we okay to continue with the weld? Now I'm gonna press start. And the first thing it does is check the fitting connection. And it's actually now started to weld that because it was okay to go ahead. So that is actually sending power down to the fitting, through the fitting, and that's gonna get really hot down there. And one of the most important things to do with electrofusion welding is to make sure a, that you can reach the probe so you can move them straight onto your next fitting, but also they need a six minute cooling time. So it's important not to move that pipe or that fitting um, for six minutes. If you do that, you're likely to break the world and have a leak. So the machine started bleeping and it's telling me to press stop. So we're gonna stop the power going down to that fitting. And now I'm just gonna remove the two probes and put them onto my next connection. Okay, so we're just gonna have a little closer look. This is the last connection that I'm gonna to make today. And if I'm just gonna take that one back off there, you can see down here, there's two little nodules that are very flat at the moment. Um, and there's two little, it looks like there's two little pins in there. And what happens when we put the, cook the fit in and it's complete and the joint's been done, those nodules pop up. And they only come up about three or four mil. But if you look at this connection here, they're actually a, a nice sharp little spike. So if you think, oh, did I do that joint? Haven't I done that one? When you've got multiple, it's very easy to miss one. So at, 
a little last double check is just to run your finger around to make sure they've definitely been cooked. Okay, so we've come back to the other side of the manifold now, and what you've got is two spigots on the bottom of the manifold, which are 63 mil in size. Now, if you buy one of these manifolds with anything up to six connections to slinkies or borehole on the other side, these stubs will always be 63 mil. You start to get over six, seven, eight, and nine, and 10, and bigger, those connections will be 90 or potentially 110 mil. Okay, so first thing I've done before I connected these pipes up was have a look at the fitting, have a look at the cook time, and just made sure, more importantly, that these connections still actually go on to these probes. Sometimes you can get fittings and the probe won't fit over the inside of it. And what we can do there is get tiny little adapters um, that you can get from the same manufacturer that makes these, and they will just slip over those ones just to make sure that we can still weld all the fittings. Okay, so we've connected those uh, last connections on the manifold and we've now um, cooked those fittings. We're gonna leave those and it's really important to remember not to move any of that pipe work so we don't wanna break that weld. Um, I can already see that the nodules on each end um, have both pu pushed up upwards, which is a good sign. It means I cooked those and they're both extremely hot. So we just stay away from those. Really important not to um, move any of that pipe work in case we break that weld, like I said before. Um, what we do need to know now is this pipe here coming in, this is where it's important now that we let the plumber know that this is gonna be the flow because when that goes back into the plant room, he's gonna connect that to the heat pump and he needs to know what is the incoming from the ground so he makes sure he gets the right connection the other end in the plant room. The next thing the plumber has to do now is he's gonna connect up his fill and purge kit which get connected to the two ports inside the manifold um, and he's gonna fill that up with water flush out any debris and get rid of all the air. And that is how you connect a subterranean manifold.